the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Good morning. Good morning, Father. Outstanding. We have this great tendency within our own culture to be incredibly anachronistic. And by that, I refer to the fact that we look at our own temperaments and preferences and priorities, and we read them back into history, and we presume that everyone else always would have been concerned about the same things we are, with the same perspective. But scripture was written from the perspective of a worldview where the spiritual world was very real and imminent and highly accessible. The people, places, and events that appear within the scripture appear in the prophetic sense primarily. And every other shade of me is a very secondary concern. And so with that, one of the most misunderstood words in all of Scripture is sacrifice. From our modern materialist perspective, we look at sacrifice either in terms of loss or killing. We think of sacrifice as either sacrificing one opportunity for another or giving up something that we want now for something that we want more later. Or in religious terms, we can find sacrifice to either just the killing of an animal or Christ's death on the cross. But if we look at the term sacrifice in the context of the scriptures themselves, we come with a very different picture. Because if in all of the sacrifices mentioned in the Old Testament, the way the animal is killed is never specified. It is never the point. So for instance, if you go to the Passover sacrifice, which is the foundational sacrifice for the covenant with Moses at the Exodus, a lamb is sacrificed, the blood is smeared crosswise on the doorpost, and a meal is had. But if you read the text, there's no detail given as to how the lamb is to be killed, but there is extensive detail given as to how it is to be eaten, how it is to be shared, and how are you to deal with leftovers. And every other sacrifice in Scripture follows that same pattern. How the animal to be killed is relatively unimportant. But how it is to be shared and how it is to be eaten is given in great detail. There is meticulous detail as to which portion is the burnt offering, and which portion belongs to the priest, and which portion is to be eaten by the people. Within the scriptures, sacrifice is not about loss. It is about creating communion, about creating communion between the Most High God and His people, and those people, and one another. And so we get a very clear, we get a much clearer picture of what Jesus is doing when He makes a one-to-one -one connection between His sacrificial act on the cross and the sacred meal, the Holy Eucharist, calling the bread and calling the bread and wine that are offered His very body and blood broken and shed for the life of the world. Sacrifice is that vehicle by which God Almighty becomes united in fact and reality to His image and likeness. And we become like the thing that we worship. That should shed some light on the very first instance of sacrifice throughout Scripture. For the very first mention of sacrifice is in the story about Cain and Abel. Cain kills his brother because he is indignant that Abel's sacrifice should be considered more acceptable to God than his own. But the rage and bitterness that drove that first murder of the human race what really drove it underneath was a rejection of liturgy, a rejection of the communion 
that their shared sacrifice would that their shared sacrifice would cause. And that sheds some light on what Christ says about sacrifice when he speaks of it in the Sermon on the Mount. In the Sermon on the Mount, when Christ speaks about sacrifice, he says that if you are going to the temple to make an offering and you see that your brother has something against you, leave your offering, go, be reconciled to him, then come back and make your sacrifice. Notice that Christ does not ask if we assess that we also have some undealt with hurt within our own souls. Christ doesn't ask if our brother's complaint is valid. Christ doesn't ask if his criticism is reasonable. Christ simply asks us to be rigorously honest about whether or not we have in some way been a stumbling block to him. And if we have, to go and prioritize making amends to that fellow child of Adam who is also made in his image and likeness and, who is all, and for whom he is also set to die and rise again from the dead. For those who take on that, for those who accept that reconciliatory vocation that Christ sets before us, he says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall possess the earth. For blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. And notice what he calls them, peacemakers. It ain't no peace on this. It ain't no peace literally to create peace, to cause peace to be where it did not previously exist. Notice Christ does not call them peace preferers. And he doesn't call them peace preservers of necessity. Someone who sets out to create peace must be stronger than the evil that he intends to overcome. It's so much easier for us to fixate on the externals. It is so much easier for us to fixate on how many times something is changed, or what ingredients are in the food that someone sets before us, or how late we can still eat without breaking the communion fast. But as for you, put to death pride and bitterness within yourselves. And the same God who put to death pride and sin upon the cross will swiftly hear your prayer. Whereas the letter to the Hebrew says, Do not neglect to do good works and to be in communion with others, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God.